An active volcano covered in glaciers is already a very dynamic place. Climate change is adding further pressure, altering the mountain in different, compelling, and dangerous ways. Climate change has become synonymous with melting glaciers, but it also creates ripple effects throughout the environment of Mount Rainier in the Pacific Northwest. Glaciers are a source of water, spawning five major rivers that fuel communities well beyond park borders. Water temperatures in rivers are warming, affecting native species like fish. Glaciers generate and collect a lot of rocky debris. As the ice melts, piles of rock are left behind, filling rivers and dramatically changing the shape of the landscape. Hotter, drier weather patterns are shifting the timing of plants and animals and increasing the risk of fire. You will see some of these changes when you visit the park. It may restrict your access, or it may end up creating new opportunities for recreation. Scientists are studying Mount Rainier to better understand how, where, and why this change is happening. How will climate change affect the plants and animals living on this iconic mountain and the people and communities connected to it? You know, here at Mount Rainier, glacier area has declined by about 40% since the early 1900s. Uh, similar to other glaciers in the state, like in the Olympics and the North Cascades, we've seen about a 50% decline in glacier area. Um, and while this is significant, that, that rate of decline is also increasing, and that's due to, to warmer temperatures associated with climate change. Not only do warmer temperatures mean more melt during the summer, but it also means uh, a smaller snowpack. And the reason for that is that, you know, our winter temperatures are pretty mild. Uh, they hover around freezing, even up in the mountains. And so small changes in temperature can have really profound effects on whether precipitation falls as rain or whether it falls as snow. Glaciers can retreat in two ways. They, they certainly can lose area. Um, and, and you see that as that terminus essentially moves up slope as it's retreating, but they can also thin. And so, um, you know, here at Mont Rainier with the debris cover, that debris cover typically is on the lower portions of the glacier. And so you might not see that response to that terminus as much as you see the thinning of the surface of that glacier. And that's part of what we do what, with the monitoring that we're doing is it's not just area change, it's also that change in, in surface elevation and capturing that thinning. Over time, I'm, I'm expecting to see, with increased climate change and with the predictions that the, the, the climate models are indicating, um, I'm expecting that a lot of the lower glaciers, the glaciers that start at like 10,000 feet and lower, those ones will get a lot smaller and may even disappear. So like the South Tahoma Glacier starts around 10,000 feet, ends at 7,000 feet, and it's retreating pretty dramatically. And all of these glaciers that are retreating in these areas, it's very, very steep and it's very um, crumbly, loose rock. So we're having more material provided to these systems. We're basically priming the system with sediment. And we get more surges like this, where we get more intense precipitation in the wintertime, then we could see more debris flow activities. So at Mount Rainier, we have two different types of debris flows. So in the middle of the summer, we'll see these times where it's really, really hot, and you get a surge of water that comes out of the glacier. And that surge of water can then very quickly pick up loose material at the glacier terminus. Um, that mobilizes into a debris flow, it basically doubles its density so it can support bigger, uh, bigger rocks and uh, logs and anything in its path. It will then be carried downstream as a debris flow. The water is like black. Look at that tree, that's like 50 feet tall tree going down. These debris flows come down, and in this valley, we've had over 30, between 30 and 35 debris flows that we know of. Debris flows are very destructive. They also carry and carry a lot of material, and it's, there's a lot of force in that. And that material can then eat away at road prisms. It can eat away at structures and, and destroy structures that we have here in the park. Given what we're, the forecasts are indicating over time, over the next century, it would not surprise me to see an increase in debris flow activity, and that's kind of what I'm anticipating on seeing.
So it's been very well established that as a result of climate change, glaciers on Mount Rainier are receding um, and they're receding fairly rapidly and are likely to continue doing that throughout the rest of the century. Um, and that's really important for a number of reasons, but particularly because it could affect the river systems that flow down from the glaciers. So what I'm interested in is how water temperatures in glacial rivers could change as a result of glacial retreat in the future. And so it's possible that certain reaches of the river might get warmer in the future. Um, cold water zones could shift or their availability throughout the year could change. Um, and that would have implications for bull trout, particularly as bull trout are heading upstream, trying to find that cold water to spawn. So by studying bull trout um, and focusing on how they might be impacted by climate change, um, we're kind of studying this river system that many other species also rely upon. So in addition to bull trout, we also have um, species of macroinvertebrates that are only found in Washington. Um, there are other species of fish that are using these systems. And so although we are honing in on bull trout, um, we're really looking at the entire ecosystem that so many different um, species rely upon. Um, but bull trout are very cool, they're very beautiful, um, and they're very specialized. So they're unique in that they can survive in such cold temperatures, um, but also for that same reason, um, somewhat fragile in that these ecosystems that they need are really threatened by climate change. Over the last 30 years, perennial snowfields have been disappearing. Combined with lower annual snowpack and increasing air temperatures, water supplies in the park are decreasing, all while visitation continues to grow. Less drinking water is not the only result of decreasing snow. Seasonal ponds and pools, fed by snowmelt, are also drying up too soon. These habitats are essential for breeding amphibians. Western toads, a species of concern, migrate to breed in subalpine lakes. Many of their birth ponds and pools of water that toads rely on are drying up earlier in the season, resulting in mass mortalities of eggs, larvae, and metamorphs, such as toadlets. So many of these areas are wetlands and ponds and lakes that are being impacted by climate change and have these sensitive amphibian species trying to develop in them um, influence our management decisions in the areas that we really need to prioritize for protection within the park. So one example is Tipsu Lake. Um, that's a very popular and beautiful spot for visitors to check out in the summer. It's also a spot where um, Western toads, which are a rare species of concern, um, lay their eggs and have their tadpoles developing. And so while it's an amazing opportunity for visitors to see um, a rare amphibian species growing up, um, it's also uh, somewhat precarious in that if folks are um, going off trail or handling amphibians, um, it's further stressing out an already um, stressed out species of amphibian. And so um, the fact that we know climate change is impacting these species means that we need to be even more careful with protecting their habitats. Wildflowers are also constrained by snowfall. Each meadow species responds differently, and scientists and Meadow Watch volunteers are tracking wildflowers to learn more. I'm Barry Brosi. I'm an associate professor in the biology department at the University of Washington, and we're here at Mount Rainier National Park. I'm the co-director of the MeadowWatch program, and MeadowWatch is a citizen science project. So we're using volunteers to help us collect data about wildflowers here at Mount Rainier National Park. 
So the reason that we set this project up, this uh, project was set up six or seven years ago, and the idea is that we are interested in understanding how the timing of wildflowers is changing. So plants and animals um, use different kinds of cues from the environment to trigger um, these different stages of, of their life. So here, um, here at Mount Rainier National Park and in many other montane areas, a lot of plants use snowmelt as a trigger to let them know that it's time to start, for example, growing. Many of the early blooming plants, um, things like avalanche lily, for example, will start to bloom shortly after the snow melts. And um, so they're really using that snowmelt as a trigger for when they bloom. And I will say different plants use different kinds of cues, so not all plants will use that as a cue. Some plants, for example, will use day length as a cue to trigger um, when they bloom. So plants that use snow melt and plants that use day length might have then, you know, increasingly different um, bloom times uh, because of that disconnect. Insects um, also use different kinds of cues um, depending on the species, but for many of them they actually use a sort of integration of, um, of temperature over time. They have to accumulate enough warmth over a long period or a long-ish period of time in order uh, for their development to occur and in order for them to emerge. So if we see um, snowmelt happening very suddenly, for example, as a consequence of some really warm, um, unusually warm days that can really trigger fast snowmelt that can then get the plants blooming, but that might not be enough, it might not be enough in terms of the number of days, say above a certain temperature, for those insects to actually emerge. And so because of that, we could see, we could see for example, a disconnect there in, um, in the plants and the pollinators in terms of when they're emerging, um, when the insects are emerging and when the plants are blooming. Again, there's concern that then this could lead to long-term uh, problems with um, plant pollination and thus plant reproduction and then ultimately um, thinking about the number of plants that would be there in the next generation, the seeds and, um, and seedlings going forward. So in terms of setting this up as a citizen science uh, project, um, this has been a really wonderful way to get people involved, volunteers involved who are um, interested in hiking these trails here at Mount Rainier National Park and helping us gather data. So by having um, lots and lots of volunteer boots on the ground, uh, we are able to collect a lot more data than we would be able to uh, in the absence of all of those volunteers. So we're getting thousands and thousands and thousands of data points every summer from these volunteers that are um, telling us you know, when these flowers are blooming at different points along the park, um, along these trails, so at different elevations, uh, different kinds of habitats. Um, so when that bloom is happening, sort of when the bloom is peaking, um, when those flowers close up, when the plants are producing seed, and when that seed um, then gets released. So we can start to uh, integrate and synthesize these data over many years to really understand some of the important trends that are going on and trends that might be then impacted by global climate change. In decades past, melting snowpack in the Pacific Northwest provided water to dry tree and plant matter later into the spring and summer than today, helping to shorten the window for wildfire risk. With warmer temperatures causing snowpack to melt earlier in the year, forest fuels are primed for burning earlier in the year as well. Warmer, drier conditions contribute to the spread of bark beetles that weaken or kill trees, leading to the further buildup of already drier fuels. Some studies show the culmination of these effects has extended the length of wildfire season by more than two months. Whether the fire is local or regional, smoke events are also increasing. Smoke deteriorates air quality and can have negative health effects. The park has installed low-cost sensors to monitor pollution and smoke particle levels at various locations and is creating a list of management responses to poor air quality conditions to better serve visitors. My name is Zachary Bigelow um, and we are up here in Dead Horse Creek Trail in the meadows up in Paradise on Mount Rainier. Um, my crew and myself back here 
Um, we are working to revegetate the meadows out here from meadow damage that occurs when individuals are stepping off trail. That kills the plants and we grow them down in a greenhouse and bring them back up here to the meadows to help restore them. The meadow plants live a really hard life and in general have like a really short period of time during the year where they are actually uncovered from the snow. Um, it's normally only about three months um, and during that time, that three month period of time where there's not really a lot of snow up here, um, there also really isn't any water. So it's actually really hard for these plants to be growing during the time of year that they're snow free. Um, so when we grow them and we put them in the ground in the fall, um, it's actually the best season to be putting the plants in because they don't have to stay up here and like suffer and dehydrate throughout the entire period of the summer. If we put them in the ground like right before the snows hit, then the plants really rapidly enter hibernation. They senesce their leaves, um, which means they suck all the nutrients out and let the foliage die. And all that energy goes down into the roots, um, which is what we want because they're gonna hibernate beneath the snow. And then in the spring, when the snow melts, they're gonna start to regenerate all of those leaves again. So one of the things that we have been noticing is that after a meadow has been stomped on, um, and after the plants are gone from the soil out there, the plants that we put back in the ground have a tendency to remain really small. And even though they produce seeds, none of the seeds are really taking in the soil. And so this year we are doing a series of experimental plantings. Um, we're partnered with a professor from the University of Washington, I believe. Um, and we're designing a study to see um, what different things we can do to our planting methods to kind of like increase the recruitment rate. Um, so the recruitment is the rate of um, basically seeds being able to grow and establish themselves in the plots. And we're trying to see if we can also get the plants to grow a little bit more. And all of these things are, I would say, related to climate change. Um, because as precipitation patterns change um, in response to a changing climate, um, it's putting a lot of additional stress and pressure um, on all of these plants that are so reliant in the brief periods of time that they have to get water to grow. And so really doing anything that we can to kind of like encourage their establishment and help them grow. Um, but I would also say that there really is a whole lot of room for more work and more research in terms of climate change out here, learning more about the impacts. Mount Rainier has always been a dynamic landscape and it will continue to change. Climate change is accelerating landscape processes already at work. Many plants and animal species are struggling to adapt to increasing temperatures and loss of snowmelt and water. There are steps we can take to help stressed environments from controlling invasive species, staying on trails to minimize damage to plants and reducing water use. It is essential to understand climate change to shape access and park management. What do you want future generations to experience at Mount Rainier? Thank you.